to talk about chronic pain, so I'm also talking with a psychologist and a physiotherapist who will follow my talk. Um, my task is to talk about uh, basic physiology of chronic pain, and because of the time constraints, it's actually going to be a fairly outlined kind of subject and hopefully you'll be able to use that to talk to look more into the detail to fill the leaves on the tree if you like because it's such a big area so i guess if we're going to talk about chronic pain we need to be aware of just what is the extent of the problem and around australia and the world in fact about 20 percent of people of working age experience chronic pain Although within that group, it's probably about 25% of that 20% who are severely disabled and, so, and impaired in function, um, who are actually the people that we're more likely to see seeking medical treatment. There's a lot of people who, by definition, have chronic pain, who actually function quite well despite it. But one of the other problems is that um, chronic pain is also increased with ageing. It's pretty obvious why that's the case. So greater than 30% of um, people overall suffer, suffer chronic pain in Australia. So it, it's a big public health problem. So um, pain physiology is actually very complex because it's the activation of interactions of the autonomic nervous system, the peripheral and central nervous systems, and the endocrine and immune systems. So acute pain is mostly a nociceptive kind of concept, but if it's prolonged or severe, it can also lead to changes in the physiology of pain. One of the definitions we have for chronic pain is that it's pain persisting beyond the time of normal healing. But there are many factors that influence this transition from acute pain into chronic pain. And then there are other factors that can arise after the development of the pain that actually influence the maintenance of pain. So it's really a spectrum um, and all aspects of it are relevant to the, to the management. So the other thing I wanted to emphasize to you is the huge variability in our individual physiologies. And this is a particular slide that I saw at a conference, um, it must have been in 2016, uh, from a famous uh, researcher, Roger Fillingham. And in it, it's a study of uh, thermal um, pain responses, heat pain responses across a population of, I think it's over 200, 321 healthy young adults. And what you can see is that the pain rating for the same stimulus is enormously variable for, across these 321 people um, with the lowest ex having pain level only 5% or 5 out of 100 and, and at the other spectrum some getting 100 out of 100 as the score and the mean was 71.8. So even at a starting point of just a random selection of people there's such a big variation in pain sensitivity and there's many reasons for it but I think we have to accept that there are some people who will experience more pain when they're subjected to painful stimulus at the starting point regardless of anything else there's a lot of variation. And so what happens after an injury? Well, what we know is that most people recover after an injury. So they have, we talk about trajectories of pain. So a small percentage of people who suffer an injury or an illness or a disease that causes pain, a small percentage will go on to develop chronic pain. And even though we talk a lot about risk factors and etiological factors, they're not conclusive and there's still a lot of date, debate. There's also, um, you know, people are not sure what really predisposes some people to develop chronic pain, but there are some big markers that we're becoming more aware of. So this graph um, identifies the injury, the increase in pain and the decrease in pain and return to normal life. And then the other ones who are unfortunate to go on and have chronic pain. And increasingly we know that past experiences and previous injuries are relevant. Even um, things that occur as early as in the early neonatal period. We know that children who are um, needing intensive paediatric neonatal intensive care service, that they are much more susceptible to pain. And when they looked at cortisol studies in seven-year-olds of children who'd been in uh, paediatric neonatal intensive care units, they had much elevated cortisol levels in normal people, suggesting um, even at that age group, there was a disturbance of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. We know that people who have developmental experiences that are injurious, they may be physical or psychological, psychosocial, um, seem to be at increased risk of developing chronic pain. There may be demographic factors, um, sex, gender related factors, lots of things. So all of these things are in the play and have to be considered in the management. 
And this is just emphasising the same thing again. This is a graph of the natural history of low back pain. And we know that by 16 weeks after injury, only 9% will have persisting back pain. So the majority of back pain will resolve. It may recur, but it will resolve within uh, three months' time. So this is we need to remember this. So I think increasingly, and probably most particularly for me in the last 10 or 15 years, our view of pain perception has developed a lot. We, we used to have this very Cartesian view of pain from Descartes of the 16th century, who, who made the revelation that when someone was exposed to an injury, and in this little graph, it's the example of the man who puts his foot in the fire, that there was some way that um, that message of injury and pain was transmitted from the foot to the brain and it was very much related to the amount of injury and then it was perceived and it was seen as a passive transmission along sensory channels they didn't really understand what the channels were at that stage but i've got on the on the other side a more contemporary view where we're also very much aware that there's a lot going on in the brain that's to do with what the response is. So, and in this pain experience in the brain, there's a lot of reference to prior experiences and attention and expectations and the context of the injury and many other things that are very relevant to how that will be responded. And that will influence the top-down modulatory influences. And I often call that the in inhibition. So I want you to get the concept that pain is not a fixed thing it's a very much um, dynamic and it can be upregulated and downregulated at all different times for all different reasons so acute pain is very well known i'm not actually going to talk very much about the process it's been done to death everybody knows that you know you have a nociceptive uh, stimulus it's activating a delta fibers in the periphery which are the fast fibers and they're the ones that make you withdraw your hand from the heat. And then there are the slightly slower fibres that take longer to be activated. They transmit more slowly, but when they get activated, they seem to probably play a slightly bigger role in the ongoing um, pain. It's like the first fibres are the first responders and the C fibres are there in the back ready to sort of keep the messages coming. So that's, that's the basic physiology of acute pain. And there's a whole relay station, as you well know, um, the first relay station is in the dorsal horn, then going um, through the dorsal root ganglion, um, where you have the first interaction with the second order neurons. And there's a lot of interaction even in the different lamina of the dorsal horn uh, to work out the sort of pain and to uh, communicate even with above, above and below levels. And we know that um, in the periphery and the peripheral terminal that there's a lot of chemical um, responses which activate ion channels with all sorts of neurotransmitters as well. And I've tried to illustrate here on the graph um, on the bottom corner of the, uh, the slide that we've had this very old fashioned view of a peripheral terminal or even a second order terminal as being in isolation, but in fact it's surrounded by glia. And I'll talk more about glia because glia are clearly major players in what's going on with sensory and, and neural function that can influence it. And increasingly, this is becoming a topic of interest for researchers um, who are looking at ways of developing better molecular treatments for pain. And then you need to think about the cerebral signatures of pain. So we know that there's basically a transmission from the um, brain stem up through the uh, ascending pathways, the thalamus, the periactal duct or gray, into various cortical regions, which extend from the frontal cortex, involve the insular co cortex. So it's a very complex pathway of processing and referral. So again, this is just my slides to remind you not to forget the neural synapses have glia in them. And there's a lot of different sorts of glia. There's the astrocytes, the microglias, and the oligodendrocytes. And these are all um, active. And I'm not having a chance, there's not enough time to talk in detail about this, but it's an interesting area for further reading, which I hope you'll take on. So the glial cells reduce release cytokines, chemokines, and other neuroactive substances. And these can disrupt excitation and inhibition by amino acids and uh, disturb neurotransmitter hemostasis. They actually serve to elevate neuronal excitability, um, which can also contribute to prolonged pain. And it's believed that the glial cells are actually playing a big role in the chronification of pain going from acute to chronic pain. There are also some substances that these cells 
uh, can re release which influence the settings of the nerves. And one of the concerns we have is that the long-term impact of opioids through the toll-like receptors. Uh, so some, some, what we increasingly recognise is some of the treatments may actually be contributing to pain. And there's certainly concerns that opioids is one of that group of um, medications that can be used. And there's, I've actually given a reference here and at the end of the talk of um, a very good review in neuroscience of that particular topic. Um, and I think many of you, if you've been reading around a bit, will be aware that we've got a very lead researcher in glial work in Australia in Adelaide, Mark Hutchinson, but also Linda Watkinson from Denver in um, the States, who really sort of over the last 20 years really done a lot of work on the implications of opioids for improving clinical pain and the glia's role as bad guys. So. What, I really like this slide that I put up now because it's one of the few slides that in my mind explains what happens with opioids because we have this concept of something called opioid induced hyperalgesia. So what we've recognized over time is that there are two things that happen with opioids if you test it with um, analgesic effect against a pain stimulus. So over time, we develop tolerance to opioids and that results in needing a bigger dose of opioid to get the same analgesic effect, which is shown on the gra graph on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, we've got the hyperalgesia development, which is actually a shift across to the left. And what that means is that when hyperalgesia develops, which seems to be a feature of um, long-term high-dose opioid use, is that you don't need such a strong stimulus to um, cause increased pain. So on one hand, you've developed tolerance and you on the other hand, you've also developed hyperalgesia. Uh, so that means you're easily getting pain at a lower level. So that means that some of the stimulus that's coming in is actually not going to be something that would have been pain, but it's going to be perceived as pain. So some of the normal sensory functions can actually feel painful. And this clinically fits a lot with what we see in patients where normal activities and movements seem to cause um, unnecessary pain and lead to inactivity and withdrawal. So we need to have awareness of this dynamism and the things that have positive and negative effects. Um, I know Stefan Schuch's giving a talk later on about um, medication management of chronic pain, and I'm sure he will address some of the issues to do with opioids. But uh, obviously one of those messages is that we're now increasingly aware that opioids are not good for chronic pain management for many reasons. So the next slide is again looking a little bit more at expanding the idea of a descending pain modulatory network. So the medial and frontal cortical areas seem to be drivers of the um, modulatory ne network. But these also work with specific subcortical and brainstem nuclei. Um, and there is systems for endogenous modulation of pain. So that means the natural brain functions can modulate pain. And we know that there are endorphins in the brain. Um, there are other endogenous substances that modulate pain. And I think what we're really increasingly recognising is that there's a lot of interaction of pro and anti nociceptive mechanisms which may contribute to the development or maintenance of pain states. Um, and th this is something to take very seriously because natural endorphins are something that's released in many ways. We know that endorphins and also oxytocin are very relevant. Um, endogenous opioids are very relevant for social bonding. Um, they, we can increase our natural endorphins with things like laughter and good social interaction and probably with exercise. And what we also recognise is unfortunately that people exposed to long-term um, exogenous opioids, as in opioid administration, they kind of dull out their, um, their endogenous opioid system and that, that causes a lot of problems really. So we're increasingly concerned about those things as well. But also chronic pain leads to the sort of uh, social detachment and things like that that's going to affect people's mood um, and their enjoyment of life and their ability to interact in things that will release natural endogenous opioids. So I hope that you're starting to get a view of pain as being much more than a few nerves and neurotransmitters. So Increasingly, what we're talking about is neuroplasticity to explain the persistence of pain. And pain, plasticity can be adaptive, it can be the positive response, um, or it can be maladaptive. And I guess we see the recovery from pain 
you know, we know that if someone's got acute pain, that a lot of things happen that wind up the pain initially, but then it's also able to turn itself off. There's something working to stop it going on. And that's advantageous neuroplasticity. But the people who go on and get chronic pain, we know I've got a bit of a maladaptive plasticity. And what we want to do in treatment is to try and switch that around and develop more of the advantageous neuroplasticity, which is really the basis for a very rich sort of biopsychosocial approach to pain. And I guess the other thing is that we're recognising is that persistent pain is less about tissue damage and more about patterns of increased brain and spinal cord activity. So when the pain inhibitors are reduced, what happens is that threat and danger messages are aroused. So we used to sort of think of the brain as recognising pain, but in fact, even the concept of pain is a learned response. And, and what in fact um, the brain is responding to is saying that this is a threat or danger message and that causes a sort of hyper arousal and pain increase. It also leads to protective behaviours and it also means that some of the medications that are analgesic are less effective in relieving the pain. Um, by now you will be aware that I've got a fairly biopsychosocial view of pain and I wanted to talk about some of the developmental factors. So and genetic factors. So people are often saying, that, you know, is there a genetic predisposition to pain? Well, certainly there's no single candidate gene for, for chronic pain. It's a very diverse thing, but we, we do recognize that there may be some contribution by genetics to pain. Um, you know, for instance, we know that chronic pain is more common in females than males, but I, I think the genes are often very complex and there are multiple genes involved and they're not the definite story. I mean, not every genotype is expressed and it's really a lot more the phenotype, which is to do with the subsequent factors and interactions that determine the pain. So I think we need to put genes aside a bit, but I'm very you know, interested, I've already talked a little bit about some of the childhood risks, but certainly developmental experiences can have an effect on the way people deal with the stress of pain or injury or loss of the ability to work. Um, the other things that we see in people who have chronic pain is a lot of risk markers and factors. So clearly someone who's got a much more severe injury is probably going to have a lot bigger pain driver at the beginning and it may take longer to recover so that they've got an increased risk of persisting pain. But also we see altered mood and poor sleep as being big factors along with chronic pain. And the environment, you know, what the interaction is, you know, whether people lose work or not, all these factors are relevant. Um, and also we know that in older age, people are more likely to get chronic pain. So there's a lot of factors there that are uh, not, that are determined by environment and learning. This again is just another slide telling the same story um, about those things. And it's just to try and really emphasize that. And if you're studying about pain, these are most likely the boxes of some of the things that you might need to know more about. You do have to have an understanding of psychology and cognitions, people's belief system. You do need to understand some neurophysiology. If you've worked in a, um, any sort of occupational medicine um, service, you'd be very aware of the loss of work and the implications of it, or the environment of work can also have an effect. So all of these factors are important. Now, there are many subgroups of pain, as you're aware, and um, common ones that we talk about is nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. So nociceptive pain arrives from actual threat and damage to non-neural tissues and it's due to activation of nociceptors and the common things of that is somatic and visceral pain um, and probably the most common um, sort of uh, somatic pain that you might see in a rehab setting is actually osteoarthritis and maybe uh, orthopedic rehab after knee and uh, hip replacements so they're very common in our community but I think the other thing about nociceptive pain is it's really designed to be in contrast to neuropathic pain, which is associated with uh, uh, an injured or abnormally functioning nervous system. So what we expect in nociceptive pain mostly is that there's a normally functioning neuro, uh, neurology system going from the periphery through into the nervous system, that there's no disconnections or abnormal injury. There may be dysfunction in the nerves, but they're not injured. In contrast, the contemporary definition of neuropathic pain is that it's pain arising as a direct consequence of a lesion or disease affecting the somatosensory system. So it can be anywhere. 
So these pictures have a picture of a neuroma, which is common after amputation or even sometimes after surgery in small areas like um, post inguinal hernia surgery, sometimes people develop neuromas and pain. Um, you know, if there's injuries, there may also be injuries involving the sympathetic nervous system. When there's nerve injury, there's a lot of release of different neurotransmitters. And I think it's important to get these things clear because there's a bit of a blur that people think all persistent pain is neuropathic pain or all pain that's associated with sensitization in neuropathic pain, but it's not strictly so. And possibly the treatments for that would be different. So uh, I'm wary of that blurring of the definitions. So um, let's look at one of the gurus of pain who did a lot to describe what sensitization is. So these um, illustrations are of normal uh, neural function in the periphery where you get a stimulus, which is the little yellow triangles. It activates a nociceptor. It goes to the first order processing and it goes into the pathway which says pain. Um, pressure can also cause a low threshold mechanoreceptor to activate, but that's not um, that's more with touch if there is actually pressure as opposed to an injury where there might be fire or a chemical or a cut or something. Whereas um, a low threshold mechanoreceptor is touch and that can then convey into the other pathway, which is the pain pathway. So we talk about peripheral sensitization, but I'm only going to be brief on this today, which is basically an increased responsiveness to and reduce threshold of nociceptive neurons in the periphery to stimulation in their receptive field. So that's what we'll just leave that. But, but we do know that peripheral sensitization leads to the first order changes in the second order neurons, which can contribute then to central sensitization. Um, there's a lot of work around this and it's still worth reading Clifford Wolf's um, papers because he's, he's very clear about this. So the nociceptor can trigger a prolonged but reversible increase in excitability and synaptic efficiency of neurons in central nociceptive pathways, and that leads to the central sensitization. And it manifests as pain hypersensitivity, and the particular that we talk about is dynamic tactile allodynia, which is like a moving stimulus, a touch stimulus that's moving. It might be a brush. You might test with a brush. Uh, normally uh, quite a pleasant sensation can cause allodynia and pain. You can also get secondary punctate or pressure hyperalgesia with, hyper, with uh, after sensation. So that you, you cause pain, but it persists or there's hypersensitivity in the area. You can get enhanced temporal summation, which means that areas surrounding an area of injury also start to respond to sensory input with summation. But we still have this view that sensitization is a plastic and it's a reversible response. So our interest is in being able to, to wind it down when it's appropriate. And what we see again is what I've talked about before, which is that there is this central sensitization. So our normal nociceptor pathways are actually so activated that the stimulus becomes hyperalgesic or allodynia. So these are important concepts in the persistence of pain. And this is just an example of how you might test in a laboratory setting, but you can translate some of these into your normal bedside testing. So there's the, there's the soft brush. Um, on the right, there's the von Frey hair, and you can measure the point at which that's perceived as a perception as a threshold for sensory testing. Um, and the other one is the thermal roller. This is a machine that has the thermal roller at a set temperature, um, and you can see whether that causes pain or not. So that's uh, also, you can just use a cold, uh, tuning fork as your bedside tool to test for these things to see whether they're abnormal. So we've already talked about sensitization as increased responsiveness of nociceptive neurons and it's associated with the development of pain. But I'm just really wanting to tell, talk to you about a little bit about central sensitization because many people, I think, misuse central sensitization as a sort of a thing, a real disease, but it's really a phenomenon to describe what's going on. Um, uh, and how it's affecting function. It isn't really a, it's a dysfunction, if you like, rather than an injury. Um, and I think we just have to be careful because to me, it's a way of explaining why pain persists. In a way, we're probably saying that a lot of chronic pain is central sensitization. And the usefulness of that is that it then leads us into a, a different approach to treatment um, and recognizing and trying to explain to patients themselves that 
what they're feeling is not more injury, but just the response of the nervous system, and then it can be overcome with the right approach. So I think that's a useful phrase in that concept, but some people have this view that once you sensitize, it's the end of the world, and it, I think we just need to be careful. So basically what we have is more pain with less provocation. We've got that graph that we saw with the opioids again, which the stimulus intensity has shifted to the left and you need less um, stimulus to achieve the pain uh, threshold and the intensity. It's not neuropathic pain, as I've just said. And the other thing about central sensitization is it's often not as well localized. It's more regionalized or widespread. Uh, to the point that you almost cannot tell how it might have started, what injury was there at the beginning, because it becomes so generalised. So, and the other thing is that it can develop from nociceptive pain as well as neuropathic pain. So the next concept is neuroplasticity. Now, neuroplasticity refers to physical changes in your brain that result from uh, the inputs into the environment, the emotions you feel and the things that you do. Um, this is really connections of your neural networks that hold a memory, sometimes for a very long time. And when it's activated, it becomes very strong. And, and there's this sort of saying that neurons that fire together, wire together, and some of that's well learned over a long time. So sometimes neuroplastic responses can almost reactivate a dormant circuitry. So for example, a contextually stressful environment, with a severe accident with a lot of um, fear and uh, you know, terrible kind of response can really activate fear from previously learned experiences. It can also create new circuitry, it can break new pathways through and it can rewire circuitry. So it, it's very um, interesting and uh, fascinating, but it, it sometimes can be maladaptive, obviously. And so I guess what we're looking for in our rehabilitation approach to these chronic problems is how can we also utilize neuroplasticity therapeutically? Because we know it's very important to survival and it's an adaptability thing. And you can think of a lot of things that you do, which is due to neuroplasticity. Um, and the, the example it gives here is driving home automatically and you know where to turn left and right, which lane to get in. And you probably do it some days going to work without even really thinking, it's just so automatic. And some of us have even found ourselves driving to the wrong workplace in the morning because we're just on automatic. Uh, that's, that's plasticity, it's saving us a bit of brain energy, I guess, to get where we need to go. Um, and, you know, th things you can remember easily. So sometimes what we want to do with adaptability is retrain some of these plastic responses because they're very quickly acquired after an injury and pain. Um, and they do take a bit more work to um, extinguish some of the maladaptive changes. Now, my colleagues here are going to talk a bit more about these things in a therapeutic context. But I did rather like this work from Michelle McDonald in South Australia. And she studied aerobic exercise uh, in brain effect using um, actually transcranial magnetic stimulation with um, MRI to actually see what activated, what areas were activated. And they found that cycling as an exercise was, was interesting because it activated wider areas than you'd expect in the motor cortex. It didn't just activate the lower limbs, it activated the hands. And this was a more widespread effect. And we know there is a lot of things about exercise that keep the brain fit and healthy. We know that moderate to low intensity exercise promotes plasticity and learning. Um, there's evidence that running can improve learning. So we see this all the time if, if we use it right in the right way. So obviously this means that it makes sense for appropriate exercise to be part of a rehabilitation program for people with chronic pain. So we have to learn how to get over the fear of the pain and uh, find a way of achieving some exercise for the beneficial effects. So what are some of the other components that promote adaptive plasticity? So things like stress management and relaxation techniques are very important. And not only just to learn about them, but actually practice them. Meditation, which is allowing a settling of the nervous system and a calming of effects, probably reduces cortisol levels. Patient education, and that has to be delivered in a way that the patient can understand and me make it meaningful in their own context. Visualization of the way to approach things, looking at memory and retraining the body to move without eliciting pain. So for many patients, it might be just moving differently or trying some different form of exercise or stretching in their normal life, something they enjoy, which can allow them to move again more freely. So I think we've got a really good opportunity here to use this new research to both find mechanisms underlying pain and it gives us an appreciation of the interaction between mind and body. 
and it holds some um, important keys and promises for the future. So this is my summary slide and I'm sure you get copies of it. So in most cases, pain resolves. Chronic pain is an upwise, up, stepwise upregulation and many factors are in place even before an injury that influence the development of chronic pain and others develop in the course of the impact of an injury. Um, we've talked about mood, social engagement, all these things that really are our sort of uh, template, if you like, for a rehabilitation model. And I really hope that when you finish these lectures on chronic pain and you talk about them, that you'll realise that we're very strongly married to a rehabilitation model of pain. We're looking about adaption to disability, challenging the, the beliefs, stretching and, and many different things. And I think the other area where I'm really pleased in rehab is to see how much interest there is in neuroplasticity and brain and, and neurological injury of rehabilitation. It's like, like we're coming together a bit again with the neurology approaches. We're actually sharing a lot of these ideas. So hopefully you'll get that. And, and the pa chronic pain management isn't just about medications or magic surgeries or anything. It's actually more about an adaptive rehabilitative approach to disability. So uh, the other thing is really there's a lot more reading to do. This is very brief. Um, and I've, I've outlined the key aspects and hopefully I've given you a bit of a structure to hang stuff on. Um, and I've got some references at the end of the talk. Now, if you wanted to ask some questions of me now, I'd be happy to answer them. We've got time this, this afternoon to do that. Um, or we can save them and do them at the end. I don't know what you'd like to do. Any, anybody got questions? Nobody's coming through. Nobody's unmuting and saying anything. Okay. Well, um, I'll just uh, just bear with me while I uh, change the slides, and um, Pauline uh, Gardner will be the next speaker. So let me introduce Pauline and here's her slides. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk um, across three different areas, but uh, Carolyn's covered quite a lot of the mentioned in the talk, um, which is really good. It sets the stage. So the three areas that um, we'll cover is looking at the psychological factors that uh, are involved in persistent or chronic pain. The next is looking at what happens when um, a client or a patient comes through to talk initially to a psychologist and the important things that uh, you need to think about if you're sending someone to a psychologist and things you might think about preparing them before they actually uh, get to see a psychologist. And the third area is looking at um, the treatments um, that have developed over time for chronic or persistent pain. And uh, that is the cognitive behavioural approach, but more recently there's um, the sensory motor psychotherapy approach. Um, in terms of the definition, um, I won't go over a lot of this, but what I wanted to highlight is that part of the definition of pain um, is that, yes, there's a sensory aspect, but really there's, it's an emotional experience. When we experience pain, it actually activates the emotional centre of our brain, whether we want it to or not. So that's part of the experience of pain. The other thing is that um, uh, often when um, patients come in, they say, well, you know, I've got pain, but I've been through all the investigations and no pathology or damage has been found. It's important to remember that you don't need to have any of that identified for people to experience ongoing persistent pain. So some of the um, areas Karen, uh, Carolyn mentioned already um, that are involved in the psychological um, aspect. So what we're looking at is 
the evaluation, how people think about things, their attitudes, their beliefs, their expectations. Um, for an example, often we're looking at how people assess their, their pain and the changes that are happening in their life. And one of the things we do find is that for a certain amount of patients, there is a lot of catastrophizing, which is overreacting to um, certain experiences and sensations. We're not certain whether that's just happening after the pain moves um, to being um, persistent or whether that was their style um, of evaluating the stimulus before the onset of pain. The other factor is looking at learning. Um, uh, we all learn to, over time, to react to uncomfortable stimulus. Um, and it's really important when people develop pain that we look at how pain is reinforced or how pain might be punished. So if you've got um, a situation where people around you are very solicitous, very supportive, um, then that's a good base. But if you find that the family are treating people um, over time as invalids, not allowing them to even make a cup of tea um, or do basic things, then you're actually reinforcing um, the experience of pain and people um, becoming disabled by pain. Um, also, in some situations, uh, people can experience others around them punishing them if they talk about or uh, show any pain at all. And over time, that can lead to a lot of conflict in their relationships and in their interaction with other people. And that form of stimulation um, can activate the emotional centre of the brain more and spill over into these other areas that process um, a lot of um, the warning signals that are coming to the brain. The other areas are our emotions. Um, uh, things like activity levels or depression or mental health issues need to be looked at and taken into account. Um, there was a study done here in the late 70s um, where uh, patients who were going in for a whole variety of just ordinary surgeries were given some questionnaires before surgery and then questionnaires were given after surgery and they looked at the responses of people post-operatively. And one of the things that they found is people who go into surgery with a higher level of anxiety um, experienced higher levels of pain uh, in the post-op period and required a lot more medication to dampen down that pain. So mood um, does play a really important part and it needs to be kind of looked at when we're assessing people. Also, personality variables. There are lots of different sorts of personality types. Um, it's important to kind of look at how people are. So some people are very introverted and some people who are constantly looking at the small changes that happen to their body, to their experience, that are constantly thinking about what's happening in their mind, uh, are going to respond a little bit differently than somebody um, who's more extroverted, who doesn't pay that much attention to what's happening internally and is really focused a bit more externally. We also find that things like if people are very rigid in their personality and style of dealing with the world, um, that it makes it much harder for them to actually adapt if they develop um, persistent pain. And that creates a lot of um, issues for them. Um, as opposed to somebody who is much more flexible, more laid back, who in fact might be able to adapt um, to the ongoing pain um, and change their lifestyle more easily. And those people we might not even see at the pain management centre because they've already been able to do that before they get to us. Um, some other things to think about is cultural factors. Um, culture is different and uh, here at the pain management center we have a self-management approach so we're looking at people coming in and actually learning what they can do for themselves to help manage uh, the pain and manage some of the other things that come with pain 
Um, there are some cultures that have an external locus of control, um, which means they're often looking for someone outside of themselves to help them take away the pain or to take away the um, sensations that they experience or significantly reduce the pain they're experiencing. So they're looking for surgery, they're looking for treatment or they're looking for God to make a change. And our idea of trying to get them to learn some strategies is really alien to them. So it's often very hard when we get people with that external locus of control, when they come in and we need to help them learn self-management strategies. The other thing is that some people come from very stoic cultures where they're not supposed to express pain, they're not supposed to show pain. You've got to have that stiff upper lip, which means you have to just soldier on no matter how you feel. And people can do that for a period of time. Um, but after a while, people begin to get quite tired and it's very hard to keep up that um, type of behaviour. And so when they come to us, they're often very uncomfortable with talking about pain, with actually uh, looking at expressing what's happening to them to a psychologist and other people and getting assistance from other people to help them change um, their behaviours and learn um, some more helpful strategies. Um, and last but not least, we do need to look at early life experiences. So um, some people have trauma in their early life, people who suffer um, perhaps abuse in their early life. Um, that can affect people long term for the whole of their life. Attachment history. Sometimes you get people who are very, very dependent and they've had this long term attachment history. Um, so when they come to us, they want to stay with us forever and they want to be looked after. And again, the idea of self management, them looking after themselves can be a little bit um, difficult for them. And it's very hard for us sometimes to discharge people because they really want to stay attached to us. So looking at early life experiences and trauma is really important. So what we're looking at um, psychologically is the combination of the cognitive, the behavioural, the emotional, the physiological and the biological in determining a person's experience of pain. And we call that the neuromatrix. Now this slide just uh, outlines what we're actually looking at when we're assessing people. Um, so we're looking at, first of all, um, people's predisposing factors. What are the long-term issues that might predispose someone to develop pain? So as Carolyn mentioned, um, childhood illnesses might sensitise the, um, the nervous system, uh, trauma at that uh, again, a person's personality, um, but also people, as, as Carolyn mentioned, um, come with different sensitivities. Some people are extremely sensitive um, throughout their life and some people are much less sensitive. So that's going to impact um, what happens when they have the onset of acute pain. Um, what we call uh, more short-term or precipitating factors. And that's the kind of psychosocial issues that might be occurring before the onset of pain or before someone um, has an injury. And that can be very recent, a few months, or sometimes we look back for a year or two. And if there are a lot of issues that are going on, we need to take that into account. If there are a lot of work issues, a lot of conflict uh, in the work situation, if there's perhaps a separation uh, in a marriage or there are difficulties with children, a whole range of things that can occur before the onset of pain. Again, that produces a lot of additional stimulation that stimulates um, the emotional centres and spills over into the other areas. That stimulation then can wind up um, or um, turn up the volume of pain. Um, the other thing we're looking at is learning factors. So once pain begins, what are the factors that are reinforcing um, the pain? Um, so to give you an example, 
Um, in one situation, we had a young woman who had been working for several years and she really enjoyed her job. Um, however, um, her old boss left and a new supervisor came and there was a great deal of conflict. She didn't get on with them. She had an injury, not at work, but outside of work. Um, uh, but she felt when she came to see us that she couldn't go back to work because of the pain. She actually was quite good at being able to learn the strategies, improve her level of activity and cope more effectively until we got to the point of talking about return to work, in which case she'd have a flare up and then she would find that she couldn't um, cope with things again. After a while, we saw this pattern. We had a look and talk about work issues and she said she couldn't go back under that supervisor. So what the clinic did was to contact work, see if we could get her shifted to another department under another supervisor. We were able to do that. Um, they were quite accommodating and she was then able to go back to work. So that kind of reinforcement um, of the pain being off because of what was happening at work, those things are really important for us to be aware of. And as Dr. Arnold was saying, the sensitization of the central nervous system. Now this diagram just um, gives you a bit of an idea of when we're assessing people, um, we're looking at the predisposing factors. So all of those are very complex. We're looking at personality, mood, uh, trauma, the biosocial issues, the precipitating factors. And then on the right hand side, we're looking at the factors that begin once pain is occurring. Um, so we are looking at predisposing biopsychosocial and learning factors that impact um, uh, on a person's pain experience. But also we're looking at the factors um, that kind of help them engage in a self-management approach. So in assessment, um, we are looking at these factors, which are the long-term ones, um, the short-term factors, and then the ones that occur. And we're often looking at, um, over time, the impact of pain and the effect uh, on people's life. So if we're looking at the mental factors, people will often find pain will affect their cognitions. Uh, often memory and concentration become a problem. People lose motivation um, and have issues with attention. People's emotions are much higher because of the stimulation of the emotional centres, um, but because of all the change that happen in their life and all the difficulties that come as a ripple effect of pain. So we need to assess people's um, emotional responses, their anxiety level, their depression, their irritability, but also we need to look at the physical functioning what changes have occurred uh, in various areas of their life. So the following slide um, gives you a little bit more of an idea. So in our assessment, we will look at things like sleep. Pain does significantly affect many people's uh, sleep. So we do know that when people aren't sleeping well, they often have onset problems, they wake at night because of the pain, they don't have good restorative sleep. And a lot of the research shows that that actually can increase people's levels of pain, as well as making them much more fatigued, which makes it harder for them to deal with pain and other issues. We'll look at their work, what's happening with that. Um, looking at what's happening at home, what domestic chores they can still do, what they have trouble with, um, what tasks they've had to hand over to other people. We also look at their social activities. When people develop pain, after a while, they often feel uncomfortable about interacting socially with people. People ask them about their pain, when are they going to get better, when they're going to get back to their usual routines. And so people will often begin to withdraw and become socially isolated. They also uh, tend to give up their leisure and recreation. So things that used to help them perhaps manage their stress, that gave them a lot of pleasure, um, that they often um, disappear in their life because they aggravate pain or because it means interacting with other people. Um, often 
the sexual contact is affected as well as the marital relationships. Um, so often there's a lot of tension and conflict in marital relationships that just exacerbates a whole range of the emotional responses. Um, so there are all these areas that get affected um, because of ongoing pain. As well as assessing all of those, when we're looking at people, we're also looking at, well, what are the strengths, what skills, what resources, what supports do they bring to um, working on the issue and learning to manage pain? It's really important to know what their strengths are, what skills are. Have they learned meditation in the past? Are they using it to help with their emotions and help with their pain? Um, are they people that you can get them to read a lot of information and get them to do a lot more self-management? So we need to know all of those when we're assessing people. The other area we need to look at is in an assessment, what is the resistance there might be? What is the barriers to, their, to them learning how to manage their pain? And that's really, really important because although when people come, they will often verbally say, look, I really want to manage my pain more effectively. I'll do anything that you ask, anything that you tell me to do, I will do. But once you start working with them, um, you'll often see there's quite a bit of resistance and there's quite a few barriers. Um, so that's the, the information we also need to know so that we can work on that so that they can begin to make some changes. Um, to give you a case example, um, we had uh, a woman in her mid 40s who um, was married um, and her husband used to beat her quite regularly. Now she had an accident um, and her pain developed from an accident, not from the abuse that she received. Um, and it was interesting when she came to us and we looked at treatment, she was really willing. She said, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. But when she came, she was very resistant to doing anything that we asked her to do. And we really talked to her and looked at the information and we discovered that her husband, because she had pain, had stopped beating her. Um, and her concern was that if um, her pain was to be reduced or she managed better, perhaps her, her husband would go back to beating her. So in that instance, it was going to be very hard for us to make the changes um, with her that um, she um, would benefit in some ways because of that possibility of what she'd have to experience um, if the pain reduced or she managed more effectively. Now, that was the first part. The second part is what happens when someone works through our door as psychologist? Um, they'll come in and they'll sit down and many people will say straight away, why am I seeing a psychologist? I'm not mad. My pain is real. I'm not imagining it. I'm not making it up. Uh, it's quite physical. So why am I seeing you? Now, there's a lot of people who come in who don't say that, but they're thinking that. So often one of the first things we have to do is to try and explain um, what's happening with their persistent pain and the reason they're actually seeing a psychologist. So usually, often in the first um, assessment, we often spend quite a bit of time educating them about um, what's involved in their persistent pain. So we talk about the, fa the fact that the pain is real and physical. They're not making it up. We believe and accept that they have pain even when there's no identified pathology or disease process. And we talk um, about the things that Carolyn has explained about the changes that happen in the, the body, in the central nervous system, the changes that happen in the brain and the way that the uh, brain and the body interact together, how the changes occur um, and how that can often feed in and maintain or aggravate their pain experience. So we also need to talk about um, the emotions and how they impact pain. 
or make it harder for them to deal with pain. So we talk a lot about anxiety, talk about the brain and the fight, flight and fright response and the physiological changes and the changes in the brain. We often talk about anger and the adrenaline and the production of muscle tension that produces more stimulation that feeds into the brain. And we also look at what happens when they focus a lot on their pain, their body, um, and how the brain processes that stimulation. Um, and if they distract themselves, then the same stimulation is coming up from their body to the brain. However, the brain has something else it focuses on um, and um, it processes less of that stimulation. So the people, when they're using distraction, it actually helps um, distract them so they're less tuned in to what's happening in their body. So um, in terms of pain management, we talk about the things that we can help them learn, like relaxation, meditation, pacing, stress management. And after we've explained all of those things, most people are quite happy to sit and have a chat to us and agree to come and be involved in treatment. But until we do that education, then it's quite difficult to get um, people to work with us. Now, um, I won't spend much time on this, but uh, several years ago, we did develop a SMART program, which is a pre-education program, where we're actually going over a lot of that stuff the psychologists and the other therapists talk about, um, so that these days, by the time they get to um, the allied health staff, um, they've actually been, in, uh, all of those things have been talked about, so they're much more familiar. So now when they come in through the door, um, we're actually doing much less education, um, which is good from the beginning and we can start treatment much more effectively. We often have to explain to um, the patients that pain in effect is very similar to other things that they experience, to when they're seeing, when they're hearing, when they're smelling, um, that that's information that it either comes into the body or um, comes from the body and that stimulation comes up to the brain. But unless that brain processes that stimulation, then you can't see or you can't hear or you can't taste. And how pain is very similar. Unless the brain processes all that information, um, those warning signals and the stimulation, then people don't experience pain. And that their pain is the product of the brain processing all of that information. And though it's happening in the brain, um, it's real, it's not imagination. Now, the last area is looking at treatment. Um, what we're looking at here is just a slide with the number one. What we're looking at is working on the factors that are contributing usually after the onset of pain, um, the reinforcement fa factors, the emotions. And so we start there often. And once we've done a little bit of work on that and people learn some strategies to manage, we move on to area two, which is looking at some of the uh, trauma issues, um, looking at work factors, family and the psychosocial things that were happening before the onset of pain. And the last one, the predisposing uh, factors, um, we used to see people for a long period of time. Now we have a two year limit. So most of the time we refer out for that long term trauma issue or developmental or attachment issues um, that might be involved. And the last um, couple of slides is looking at our specific treatment and that's to reduce and control the level of pain or help people distract themselves or alter pain sensations and work on their emotions. So the cognitive behavioural strategies, the behavioural ones are things like pacing, doing a bit of activity followed by rest, followed by activity, learning to stay within comfortable um, limits initially and gradually um, increasing their level of activity over time as they build up uh, more effective ways of increasing um, activities without making pain worse. Looking at distracting activities, the things that don't increase their pain, substitutes for things they can no longer do long term, 
we also look at pleasant things which drop out of people's lives. So now, instead of just looking at reducing the problems and difficulties, we're trying to get them to increase their pleasant and enjoyable activities. We often talk about um, medication and the importance of taking it uh, as it's prescribed and the reason for those things. Various relaxation, breathing exercises, muscle relaxation. We use biofeedback to give people a little bit more objective um, view of what's happening in their muscles so they can see and hear when muscles are tightening and when muscles are relaxing. And the mental and cognitive strategies, um, things like um, uh, music or reading, things that they can do when their pain is moderate to high, when they can't be physical, so that they can use their mind. Again, um, lots of different uh, relaxation techniques, the visualizations, mindfulness, sensory awareness. And a major one is what we call cognitive restructuring, which is altering um, people's way of thinking and their thought patterns uh, so that they can think in more useful and helpful ways. We don't often talk about positive thoughts or negative thoughts. We talk more about useful and unhelpful uh, thoughts. And the other thing is that we often hear use hypnosis um, as a way of altering levels of pain if people are responsive to that or to be able to help them distract themselves more effectively, alter their thinking, learn to relax more quicker and more easily um, than just doing it without hypnosis because during the process of hypnosis, we're much more suggestible. And the last slide is um, looking at working on the emotion and cognitive factors. So again, looking at behavioral cognitive strategies. And more recently, there's the push towards focusing more on sensory motor retraining. Uh, one of our psychologists is looking um, and working more in that area. Um, our other psychologist um, does more existential work. Uh, so we all do something a bit different. Uh, I do a lot of relaxation and the hypnosis. So lastly, some of the other techniques, stress inoculation, stress management, searching training, communication trainings, goal setting, sleep management, marital and relationship counselling. We do quite a lot of that, problem solving, and more recently, acceptance and commitment therapy and dialectical behavioural therapy, especially with people who have um, uh, borderline personality disorders. And there's lots of other strategies. So I've given you lots and lots to think about. Um, so um, any questions? So, um, if oh, you'll hold on a moment, we'll just. I suspect um, he wants to see Granddad, but he probably wants to see your tools. Hearing a question? It appears no one has any questions. Good, okay, we're just putting up the next lot of slides um, and introducing Liz O'Leary. She's just coming now, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Liz, I'm a physiotherapist here at the pain clinic. And I just heard Pauline saying that when people see the psychologist, they're resistant. Everybody loves seeing the physiotherapist because um, people expect a hands-on approach. So we work quite differently to Pauline. Um, she eases them into seeing her. And with us, we have to help them to understand that what we offer without a hands-off approach is helpful. Um, I don't know where this so you've heard a lot already, so I'm going to just stay within three points. One is central synthesization, but again, just one slide. Then I want to talk about pain neuroscience education, which, um, which in the literature is also called therapeutic neuroscience education. And then I want to look at um, movement exercise and particularly anti-gravity muscles as a pain management 
um, approach. So again, central synthesization, you've heard a lot about today. So in this little slide, this is the injury point. The injury triggers the nociceptive or the alarm or the danger system, which are terms we often use with, with clients. Eventually, um, the brain will produce pain and um, normal tissue healing occurs usually within three months. In the cohort of patients which you've been hearing about, for um, predisposing reasons, but also reasons, um, psychosocial issues around the time of the injury, the pain persists, the nervous system stays sen sensitive and doesn't calm down to the level before the injury. Um, of course, sometimes there's not an injury, sometimes migraine, fibromyalgia. So in those cases, people already have a sensitive nervous system, which eventually trigger a pain response. So as a physiotherapist, even though the tissues have healed and we explain this to patients, we discuss and acknowledge to the patients that there are issues in the tissues. So a very common issue in the tissue is a loss of tone in anti-gravity muscles, which I'll talk about later. That includes the core muscles. That loss of tone in anti-gravity muscles leads to joint instability. It leads to an increase in tone and tightness of the prime movers as opposed to anti-gravity muscles, a loss of postural awareness and a loss of bone density. What we all, uh, some other issues in the tissues that we see a lot are neural dysfunction, and that's when the actual mechanics of the nerve itself are affected, like the sciatic nerve is tight or the median nerve. And the other issue is joint stiffness related to inactivity. So I'm going to explore the three points, the central synthesization, the pain neuroscience and exercise within a case study of a 57 year old woman with a 12 year history of left knee pain who's come to the clinic. Um, since then she has developed, since the onset of knee pain, she has developed pain in her lumbar spine and in her hips. Her past medical history is that she's had two partial knee arthroplasties, she's had a left adhesive capsulitis, she's a 20 year history of anxiety and depression, she's postmenopausal, there's no red flags. Her recent general history is unremarkable medication. She is, uh, uses Panadol Osteo and an antidepressant and she has been on opioids in the past, but not at this point. So rather than um, going through the assessment in a subjective and objective or signs and symptoms way. I've just um, put five slides in, in a clinical reasoning and pain management approach. So when I'm assessing, I'm reasoning, what are the signs of central synthesization I'm, that I'm seeing here? So with this woman, she's had a 10 year pain history, of persistent pain. She's had a 20 year history of anxiety and depression, which would have been, you can see now would be a predisposing factor that her system was already somewhat sensitized um, before the knee pain started, um, I think 12 years ago. She, on palpation, there was um, quite significant hyperalgesia around her knee. So that's not related to any structure. All of the medial, lateral, anterior, knee were tender with the iliotibial band and some of the quadriceps. So that doesn't fit into a structural issue. It fits into a hyperalgesic central synthesization reasoning. And in her lumbar spine and sacral uh, palpation of her lumbar spine and her sacral area triggered um, allodynia. So again, while I'm reasoning, looking at the issues in the tissues. So with this woman, um, for many years of inactivity. She has an obvious lack of muscle tone and strength in her anti-gravity muscles. And how this manifests for her is, she reports that her sitting tolerance is about 30 minutes, her standing tolerance is 10, her walking tolerance is 30. Um, loss of postural awareness is um, evident in movement and she has some reduced lumbar spine range of motion. Her left knee, which is where she had the two partial arthroplasties is, um, has good flexion, but she can't achieve that last few degrees of extension or hyperextension. So she's only missing about three degrees of extension. And bilaterally, she only has 140 degrees of um, shoulder elevation. 
So there are the issues in the tissues. So while the tissues are healed, we still look at what has happened from inactivity and aging and postmenopause, etc. So we also, um, as we've said, the pain is maintained by cognitive issues, behavioral issues and affective issues. Caroline and Pauline have talked about that a lot. So with this patient, when she completed the pain catastrophizing scale, her score was 40 out of 52, which is quite high. The main components which she gave a four, which was the highest mark you can give within that scale. The thing she gave a four to was I keep thinking about how much it hurts. There's nothing I can do to decrease the intensity of the pain. It's terrible and I think it's never going to get better. It's awful and I feel it overwhelms me. So you get a sense of the cognitive um, worries and concerns that this woman has. And as Pauline and Caroline have said, all of that increases the sensitivity of the nervous system. She also, on the, as a low self-efficacy self -efficacy score on that scale, which tells us again um, that she feels she hasn't got many resources at the moment to manage her pain or her life. The other maladaptive responses are affective issues. So she's had a long history of anxiety and depression. Um, in the um, interview and in the assessment and in treatment so far, she's quite emotionally labile. So feeling quite vulnerable and also reports that she feels angry and frustrated, again, which, um, um, lead, which contribute to nervous system sensitivity. So the behavioral issues, again, these are what we call the consequences of pain, the cognitive, affective and behavioral. Um, so this woman has um, stopped working She's also avoiding social activity. Some is the pain, but some is her mood, including volunteering with scouts with her 14 year old daughter. So she was very active in scouts and um, And also in her home, in her domestic life, she isn't, her husband is doing a lot of the heavy work. The, anything to do with kneeling, um, bending, squatting because of that left knee pain. So the impression after seeing this woman, so as the clinician, the re, how I reason it is this woman has had a 20 year history of depression and, and anxiety. So would have had a level of sensitization of the nervous system before her knee pain started. The knee pain was um, treated with two arthroplasties four years apart, but there probably was a component of chronic knee pain, I would imagine even back then. So then she developed a left knee regional pain syndrome, which led to deconditioning and fear avoidance of activity, social activity work. That fear avoidance of movement and activity would have resulted in um, contributing to the chronic low back pain and hip pain, and then add the catastrophizing poor self-efficacy into that. And um, with our background in um, pain signs, that makes sense to us. But on this side, I have the patient impression. So this woman, Angela, her, her understanding is still that there's tissue damage in her back and her knee, that the increased pain means that she's damaging tissue. She wants to have the pain fixed. She also wants to lose weight. Um, her BMI is over 30, which um, also would be affecting her knee and her spine. So for me, I think a lot about bridging this gap it's easy for me to come to that um, clinical impression with our knowledge of pain science, neuroplasticity, movement. But this woman, like a lot of patients here, still thinks that that pain is from damage in her tissues. So that brings me to the second point I want to talk about, which is pain neuroscience education. So pain neuroscience education is a 21st century concept. It's only in the last 17 years. I really like that. Um, where the aim is to change the, perception, the patient's perception of pain from one of tissue damage to that of a sensitized nervous system. The expectation is when the fear is eased, patients more, are more willing to move, exercise, and engage in meaningful life activity. Um, and the main bulk of this work has been done by physiotherapists, and I think we are drawn to it because for us to provide um, education on exercise and movement and posture and activity, we need people to be willing to move without fear. 
so this is just so what does this um, p and e um, what does it involve it involves a series of lectures or education sessions really with the patient so we might use a, um, a slide like this and I'll just talk to you as I would with Angela so when she comes in and I show her this slide so I'll say so Angela this is our alarm system um, which is buzzing along in every human being it's just there then you step on say a, a rusty nail and it triggers your alarm system and when your alarm system is activated enough it will send a message to your spinal cord and to your brain so you can see it's about simplifying the complex um, physiology that Caroline presented to you into some way the patients can make it understandable and meaningful so most patients can understand that the message goes to the brain the brain may or not produce pain in this case the, the brain produces pain and what does that do for Angela well most patients will know they'll take out the nail they'll go they may go to the doctor and get a tetanus injection or they may um, clean the wound themselves and wrap it up they also know that the leg will be sore the foot will be sore for a few days and then the alarm system comes on and they're fine so patients really can hear that. So then we speak about the cohort of people who develop chronic pain, of which she is one, where now we know that the alarm system is more sensitive, that it goes up for some reason and it stays up, which as you can see from the slide, it leaves little room for activity. So for Angela, that means she has stopped doing some housework, she has stopped um, being involved with the scouts, she has stopped walking more than 30 minutes, even though she'd like to do more. Because each time she does those um, physical activities, it triggers, the alarm system triggers to a level where it sends a message to the brain and the brain is producing pain. Um, just have something else to check my notes for. Oh yeah. So then I knew there was just another part. So then I'll often say that based on your examination today, I believe a large part of your brain is due or your pain is due to this central nervous system. So rather than trying to fix some tissue damage, we'll help you with strategies that will dampen your nervous system. So that's kind of a general, everyone finds their own kind of comfort zone, what they say. So really what we're trying to do is in that little talk is we're trying to help people to understand that injury and pain are different. So the nociceptors or the danger nerves are just sending messages to the brain. It's the brain that has to decide whether to produce pain or not. And that's a healthy protective process. But as Carolyn said, it's maladaptive in people with chronic pain. So the other thing we need to then help people to understand is this idea of no brain, no pain. So even um, the Simpsons got in on this with this slide, the brain decides whether there is going to be pain or not. And that's quite a challenge for most patients to, to get their heads around. Um, but the idea that the danger messages are going in, the nociceptors, the alarm messages, but it's the brain that just takes all that information and decides whether to give pain. So I suppose I'm always looking for ways for patients to personalize what's going on. And this little um, diagram here is from a book called Explain Pain, the Protectometer, which is a patient workbook really that's been designed um, by Laura Mosley and David Butler. So they talk about when the pain persists that all our systems become edgy and you can see it may not be so clear, but there's the immune system, the respiratory system, how people speak, how they think, their sympathetic nervous system, their motor system. So we get people to tick here and people realize, they look at this and most, some people will tick 80, 70, 60% of what's there. So then that gives me an opportunity to say that all of these turned up edgy systems are sending messages to the brain, activating the alarm system and um, and that then the brain takes all of this information and produces pain. And then 
of course, the next thing patients want to know if they can, when they can absorb that is how to dampen this alarm system. So then part of the pain neuroscience education includes information on endorphins. And again, um, you've heard from Carolyn about that. But people with chronic pain produce less endogenous endorphins, especially if they've been on opioids, which this woman has been, and that these endogenous um, endorphins are stimulated, they're stimulated by education, aerobic exercise, sleep hygiene, relaxation, meditation, breathing, um, among other things. So we're just putting in suggestions. You can produce your own endorphins. These are the things, the ideas. This is what we can help you with. This is what we offer you. We always give in the um, a component an exercise, and again, aerobic exercise dampens the nervous system. Again, Carolyn said earlier about the research that shows that mild to moderate exercise um, is helpful for um, adaptive plasticity. And when we start, when we offer people exercise and ask them to start with exercise, we also acknowledge there will be an increase in pain. So if we say to somebody tomorrow, start walking for 10 minutes, we acknowledge there will be an increase in pain, but it's due to the sensitive alarm system rather than any tissue damage. We encourage graded exposure, um, which means for Angela, she can walk 30 minutes now. So graded exposure is that we would ask her to walk about 10% extra each week. So three minutes extra while um, managing to stay calm, not catastrophize when the pain will increase. What we find is we need to encourage people over time, we're talking about months, to keep doing this, knowing they're dampening their nervous system, even though the improvements um, will come slowly. We also encourage people to change their language around exercise. So things like motion is lotion, I am sore but safe, all this neuroplasticity, our education is interesting. I think I look up more of it. I feel a bit hopeful that I can walk and manage it. So that's how we're trying to change that catastrophizing through, through movement. Um, uh, providing the education also helps us to bring in the concepts of pacing, which usually involve activity or movement. We look at the ideas of overdoers and underdoers. So Angela was an overdoer until in the early part of her life, until her 40s, but has become an underdoer since um, the knee surgeries and the knee pain. So I won't go too much into this, but we've already looked at graded exposure that um, we've asked Angela to go from that 30 minutes using her now background of, and scaffolding of pain education to increase that. 10%, so you can see the pacing up and down using the 10% rule. And then looking her, at her activity, um, alternating activity with rest, so encouraging her to go back to scouts, but finding a way maybe that she can do that comfortably for her at the moment. So again, we use tools, I use a lot of tools from um, Explain Pain, the Protectometer, and also by um, a physiotherapist in the States called Adrian Louvre, who also has done a lot of work in pain education. But this is from the Protectometer. So this is, again, an easy way for patients to start understanding about um, upregulation and downregulation. So these guys have called them dangers in me, which would be an upregulation, and safeties in me, which we know is a downregulation. It's very easy for patients to work this. What a lot of people notice is they have very little safeties in me or down regulations in their lives, that they've lost a lot of that joy and dropped a lot of things that give them pleasure. And they find it easy to fill in the up regulators, the dangers about um, having pain. Um, mostly in Butler call it the protectometer because they've developed this little, little little man where this is where our system moves in the normal day-to-day -day living and when that system becomes sensitive it triggers pain so it just gives the patients a visual if they're on a six out of ten pain today they look to see are there dims that have increased we try to help people turn dims into sims so with pain education we're hoping that some of those dangers of its tissue damage will turn into a safety of I understand the pain education. I'm willing to give it a go. I trust the science. I've looked it up on the internet. There's enough people seeing it now. So that kind of thinking. So where's the evidence? 
So um, this is um, a review by Mosley in 2015. So the indications of pain conditions which benefit from pain um, neuroscience education are in this little diagram, fibromyalgia, pelvic pain, whiplash, lateral epicondylitis, low back pain and osteoarthritis. There's another, this was another systematic review of the literature done by Lou Vedal in 2016. So they found about 2000 articles on pain education of which 13 were included in the review. Um, at the um, 13 randomized control trials. And their conclusion of that systematic review was that pain neuroscience education reduces pain ratings, reduces disability, reduces pain catastrophization, reduces fear avoidance, unhealthy attitudes and behaviors regarding pain. It increases physical movement and it decreases healthcare utilization. This is the effects of pain neuroscience image. So this is a functional MRI of a young dancer who's had a two year history of back pain. So what they did is they put her in the, in the scanner, showed her a movie, so she was quite relaxed. And you can see here that there's no red areas in the brain, which are the areas that light up when she has pain. The second line is when within the scanner, they asked her to do movements, which triggered her pain. And you can see the red blobs here are the areas of the brain that lit up with the pain. Then they took her out of the scanner and they gave her 30 minutes of um, education. And when they put her back in the scanner on this third row here and asked her to do the same movements, you can see there's much more, much less red blobs. So considering the research is new, it's just in the last few years, a review in 2014 said that there, there wasn't enough studies to show it was effective, but by 2016, they got some good data to show it's um, a useful tool. So that was the second. The third um, topic I wanted to touch on is exercise and movement. Again, I think we've covered the benefits of aerobic exercise and how to do it. We offer hydrotherapy and Angela has started hydrotherapy and I can see that it's quite calming, that it dampens her nervous system and exercising in water is a lot more comfortable for her. Um, I would develop an individual exercise program to try and increase shoulder range of motion and um, strengthen um, and a general muscle strengthening program. But really, we've been listening for a long time. So the last thing I really want to talk about is this idea of the anti-gravity muscles. So when Angela stands like this, she's a lot more, obviously she has a lot of abdominal um, fat, so her pot, that even makes her lumbar lordosis even more accentuated. But this idea of posture and anti-gravity muscles, so when Angela stands, she's got an increased lordosis, she's got weak gluteal muscles, she's got weak neck stabilizers. So what an anti-gravity muscle is, is the muscles that work to hold us up against gravity. So they usually go over one joint, so for instance, um, vastus medialis would be a gravity muscle, whereas um, What's, what's the quadriceps, um, the rectus femoris, sorry, would be more of a prime mover because it goes over two joints. In the hamstring, the long head goes over two joints, so we call that a prime mover, but the short head goes over one joint, or the short, um, so we call that a postural muscle. So what I like about this, yes, yeah, so Angela classically has weak deep neck, sta weak deep neck stabilizers, tight trapezius, weak glutes, tight hamstrings, tight calf, weak soleus, tight rectus femoris, and holding her up against gravity. So the anti-gravity muscles, the research has come out of space research, which show that when astronauts do daily vigorous exercise, and yet they still experience degeneration in muscle joint and bone health, which have then brought the researchers who's mainly um, Dr. Carolyn Richardson, who's a physio professor at the Uni of Queensland, who for 30 years has done a lot of the research on core stability. So she went and worked with the space research people as well and brought that back then into a physiotherapy context where to have activated and strong deep anti-gravity muscles, which include the core muscles, but not only the core muscles, it's these um, anti-gravity muscles in the trunk and in the limbs as well. 
and the sensory effect of gravity on the body. So this gravity is obviously pushing us down. So we collapse into that collapsed position when we're sitting and standing. And that these issues play a major role in musculoskeletal form and function, bone and joint health. So we work a lot on posture. The anti I like the saying, we don't challenge gravity enough in our lives. We bow to it. And now we know that bowing to it is going to um, not protect our joints, not protect our bones. And many deconditioned adults do not have the strength to counteract gravity. And Angela classically fit in, fitted into that. So with her, we do a lot of postural work in standing, in sitting, a lot of squatting. And then we integrate that into functions. So we do a lot of sitting to standing. We do a lot of stair climbing, um, squatting, lifting, reaching overhead. So this is the last slide. So what I put up is when patients who've been to a pain management program come to you. So maybe questions like what strategies are you using to calm, dampen your nervous system might um, allow the patient to share some of what they are learning or integrate some of what they're learning. How are you integrating movement and postural awareness into your daily life is another way that would support patients to think about what they're learning here and about their posture. And so these are the references. So you can see um, there's a lot of resources for your patients here if you want patients to continue to look up that pain um, education online. And there's also just another slide of references there. But thank you all. I hope it wasn't too long <laughs> listening to that for the whole afternoon. I'll put you back to Carolyn. Sorry, just quickly. If anyone has any questions, all microphones have been unmuted. Um, feel free to ask questions. If you would, I've, you can also use the chat function to type any questions in and I will announce them. It appears no one has any questions. Okay then, well, thank you. Thank you so much for your time today and thank you so much for your presentation. Okay, Terrence, thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.